the nation's entire history is the subject of Bible prophecy. So what is Bible prophecy? Let's go back to the basics and let's find out what it actually means. It means to foretell, to foretell the future and God claims to be able to do it. But let God himself from the Bible, because it's his book, tell us what he claims. In Isaiah 46, he's talking to his people Israel at a time when they had forgotten him. And he says, remember the former things of old. He says, remember me, because I am your God. Not only is he their God, but he said, there's no other God and there's none like me. He says, you cannot even compare me with any other God because there are none. He says, I can declare the end from the beginning. Now think about what that means. It means God has a complete plan in all its detail before he begins to implement, like the grand architect who has all the bricks in the mortar. He knows exactly what he needs before he actually orders anything because the plan is worked out in detail. And so God does with prophecies. He has the detail worked out before he begins. And then he says, even from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, I can even tell you the stepping stones to that, to the fulfilling of those prophecies, the, the points along the way that show people that are listening that the prophecy is still under control. It's on its way. And then he says, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And what he means by that is God claims to have the power to make his plans come to pass. We're not going to look at prophecies, ladies and gentlemen, that are hard to understand. We are going to look at prophecies that are so plain that you will be amazed. But that's our God. He's not the author of confusion, but we want to add one other little thing to get a fuller picture of what prophecy is. Because God says to one of his prophets, Amos, he said, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he will reveal it, his secrets to his servants, the prophets first. So God's telling us that he tells his prophets the prophecy so that they could go about in their day and tell the people that were alive there with them what God was doing. Then they wrote it down. And that's how we get the Bible. They wrote it down in the Bible so that people, even down to our generation, can look at those things and see what God has planned and what he's doing. <clears throat> so let's summarise what prophecy is and what the implications of that mean. God makes a plan. In our case, it's going to encompass the entire history of Israel. God then gives that plan to the prophet of his day, the prophet records God's prophecy in the Bible. Then God, working with his angels, begins to make it happen. And we should point out here, in Psalm 103, God doesn't do everything. He has a myriad of angels, immortal like himself, at one with God, who do God's commands. So he sends them to fulfill what his plans are. Only God can and will see the prophecies through to their intended end. But why does God prophesy, prophesy? And here come the implications so we can get to know him. We know, we can know who he is by what he says. You see, he claims that he can do exactly as he says. That means he tells the truth. He claims to tell the truth. Therefore, that means by extension, he will never lie to us. And therefore, we can trust him, even with our own lives. We will learn that he is in control of our world, according to his plans for it. He doesn't intervene in man's times. Everybody has free will, but he will intervene as his plan takes shape. And most importantly, we will find that he is the real God, and he alone, who is willing and able to save us. And we're going to find to be saved means to be saved from death itself. Only God can do that. So let's get to know Almighty God and begin to learn of his wonderful plans for our world that are going to unfold in the history of Israel. Right down to our day and in fact 
beyond our day. <clears throat> so the beginnings of Israel. Before we get there, we need to see the circumstance of one family that is central to the beginning of the nation because the nation grew from this family. But have a look at this family. We notice in the green there, Abram has a wife whose name is Sarah or Sarai, sorry, and Sarai is barren. She has no, uh, no child. She's 65. Her womb is dead. And we're told that for the obvious reason. She can't have children. Another thing we're told about Abram is that he and his family, up to this point in time, they were idol worshippers, which was very common in those days. But it meant that they didn't actually know there was a real God. And ladies and gentlemen, you might be in exactly that position. In our world today, God is, is being deleted. He doesn't have any value because everybody says we evolved and you hear it all the time. But that's not what God says. There is a real God and Abram's about to find out. So God sends a messenger, one of his immortal angels to visit Abram, which must have been an amazing, amazing conversation. So much so, this man turns his entire life upside down to follow a God that he's never heard of. Abram, come and follow me on a journey to a foreign land. That was the conversation. So we begin looking in the very next chapter at God speaking to Abram. Now, this is an angel, God's representative that comes to Abram. He comes for the second time because when the call came the first time, he left his home in Ur of the Chaldees and he got as far as Haran. He got halfway with his family. Most of the family decided they, that's where they would stay. And when his father died, then Abram and his, his nephew Lot and their families, they came on after a second visit from the angel. And here's what the angel said to him. Now, the Lord had said unto Abram. See, this is the second time. He says, now, Abram, come on out of your country. It's time to move on. Come away from your kindred, even now from your father's house, because they won't come any further. Come to a land that I will show you. And I'll make of you a great nation. And I'll bless you. And I'll make your name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. He's promising Abram a child, which will grow into a family, and a great nation. You can't get a nation without first having at least one child and his wife is barren. But we are dealing with almighty God here. So we just listen and watch and wait. And then he says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. God is going to look after Abram his family, and by extension, the nation that is, he is going to bring forth from Abram. And he says, I will curse anyone, anyone that tries to destroy that nation, I will destroy. Ironclad guarantee that God will look after the nation of Israel that's going to come from Abram and Sarai. And then finally, look at this. He says, and in thee, Abram, because Abram's got something to do with this, all families, that's everybody. Everybody on the earth is going to be blessed by God. He's actually saying, through you, Abram, is going to come world peace. And it's linked with Abram, and it's linked with the nation of Israel. Now, that's quite fantastic. But let's go on. Oh, where's the prophecy? That's what we're looking for. A great nation? When he hasn't got a child, that's a prophecy. Try doing that if you're not almighty God. He's going to make sure that no one ever destroys that nation. And he's going to bring world peace. That's not a bad start, is it, ladies and gentlemen? So a little further on, just a few verses later, we see Abram finally comes with Lot and their families into the land of Canaan. This is the land that God wants to show him. Later, it will be renamed as Israel. And here the angel comes again on God's behalf and says, The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed am I going to give this land. Notice, Abram builds an altar to the Lord. He worshipped idols, but already 
He is now a worshipper of God. And the Bible tells us that this seed or child is going to be a very special seed. Now, this is one of the wonders of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. You don't have to be convinced about what I might say, because where it's important, the Bible is actually going to interpret what's going on itself. So we're listening to God's voice always. And in Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, writing about this incident, he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. You see, these are prophecies, but they're also promises. He said not to seeds as of many, but just one seed. One seed will I give this land, Abram. And he names it, thy seed, which is Christ. Now, just think about what's being said here. Jesus Christ isn't born for another 2,000 years after this prophecy. So, where's our prophecy? Well, it's Christ himself. You see, Abram and Sarai were going to have a child as sure as the sun would come up because God was going to make it happen. And that one day, generation after generation, would lead to the birth of Jesus Christ, a seed of Abram. That makes Jesus Christ a Jew. Abraham is the first Jew. 2,000 years, as we said, before he was born. Let's move on. In the very next chapter, Abram and his family go down to Egypt because of a drought, and then they return. And again, God sends his angel with another piece of the promise. You see, a little bit by little bit by little bit, we end up with a jigsaw puzzle that fills out a complete picture. So <clears throat> here the angel comes again and said to Abram, after Lot has now separated, they were so wealthy they couldn't remain together. So now Abram's with his own family on his own. And he says, look north, south, east and west. Every point of the compass. Now look what he says. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if, any man, if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be. Abram got to the land that God wanted to show him and then said, oh, I'm, going to know, I'm going to give it to your seed. I'm going to give it to Jesus Christ, my son. But now a little time has passed and God says, that land, everywhere you can see, I'm going to give it to you now, Abraham, and to thy seed. We know that's Christ, but look at the big word there, forever. That's a massive state. That's a massive prophecy. You can live forever, God is saying. You can. Now look, and thy seed should be as the dust of the earth. Here's another seed. Here's a multitude of people. Ladies and gentlemen, they are like Abram. They believe what God says right throughout the ages, and they too can live forever. That could be you. If you are willing to listen and believe the things that God tells you. Where's the prophecy? <laughs> well, now the promise is forever. This is quite an extraordinary advance. And now we have a multitude to see. So we can be part of these promises if we believe them. And that's the challenge. We must believe like Abram. That's what God expects. He will make the promise. He will lay it out before us. He will make it happen. But he expects us to believe it. But he will give us signs along the way to show he's not forgotten. It's still on track. It's still on track. So that we don't get concerned that God has forgotten us. No, but we must believe. Okay, so let's summarise so far the prophecy to Abraham. God chose one man, just one. God promised him a child a family that would become a great nation called Israel. God promised to care for Abram and the nation of Israel. God promised the land to Christ, to Abram and all who believe. It's very simple, isn't it? So easy to follow. God promised believers will live forever upon the earth. He's going to show us how shortly. God promised it will be a world at peace. You see, God's promises to Abraham are really a series of prophecies. And they become known in the Bible, because of their extraordinary nature, 
under some titles. Some of the, sometimes it's called the promises made to the fathers. Abraham is the father of Israel. Or they're sometimes called great and precious promises. The apostle Peter called them exactly that. The apostle Paul said they're the hope of Israel. Jesus Christ called it the gospel. It was the good news of God to all mankind. And you read I, Jesus Christ's life and you'll find him preaching that gospel all over it from one end of his life to the other. Because this is the hope that God sets forth to all men, women, throughout all ages. He, hasn't, he just wants us to listen to him and believe because he's going to give us proof that it will happen. Okay, the next time in Genesis 15, we're just moving on another chapter. Because of the nature of all this, Abram asked the angel the next time he comes, how, how's it all going to happen? He wants to know, what's the incredible answer he gets? How's it going to happen? What's this? The angel says to him, know of a surety, Abraham, thy seed. Remember, he hasn't got one child yet, but now he's talking, the angel is talking about a number of his children. They will be a stranger in a the land. They're going to go into another land that's not theirs. They're going to go into the land of Egypt, as it turned out. And they will go into the land of Egypt, and they'll be there for 400 years, and they're going to be afflicted. They're going to be the slaves of Egypt in the end. Oops. Also, that nation whom they shall serve, God says, I'm going to judge at the end of that 400 years. And afterward, they will come out. Your children will come out with great substance. As history shows, in fact, in the Bible, it says that when they came out of Egypt 400 years later, there were 600,000 men, plus women, plus children. There could have well been 2 million people by the time they came out of Egypt. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. You're going to be buried in a good old age. That's Abram's answer to the question, how will I inherit it? God says, you're going to die. You see, God doesn't, while he tells us the truth, sometimes he likes to make us think. And Abram would have been thinking very hard at this point. What does that mean? He works it out. And then in, at the end of this, the angel says, in the fourth generation they'll come out, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. They're the people that lived in the land of Canaan. And God is such an incredible God, he wants no one to perish. He would not give the nation of Israel that land until the Amorites that lived there were so wicked that God couldn't save them. That's an indicator of the love and the absolute amazing care of Almighty God. Again, the prophecy. The seed, still, he has no child. There's a God just talking as if it's all going to happen. He says, they will come out of Egypt after 400 years, but you're going to die, Abram. You're not going to see it. And he'd ask, how will I inherit it? You see, Abram is given 400 years of future history before he has a child of Israel's history. And Abram's worked out how he's going to inherit it. He knows that God will resurrect him from the dead. That's how he will inherit it. He won't see it then. It was for a long way off. And we'll see he actually believed exactly that. He has amazing faith in Almighty God. Okay, later, God changes their names to Abraham and Sarah. He does it for a reason. Abram, Abram means lofty father. But Abraham means a father of many nations. He's got no child. And God's now calling him a father of many nations. He's 100 now. She's 90. She's barren. And they've been in the land waiting for this child for 25 years. And they never wavered. Well, Sarah had her concerns. But God worked with her. Now is the time that she also believed like Abram. But what was Abram thinking about this child that's supposed to come, that he believes God will give him? 
Again, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans, he said, speaking of Abram, he says, he can sit, sit in not his own body now dead. See, Abram's 100. He says, it's too late for me. I can't have a child either. And my wife's barren. When he was about 100 years old, he said he neither considered the deadness of Sarah's womb. He actually did think. He said, look, I'm too old. My wife's womb is dead. We can't have a children. But look what it says then. He staggered not at the promise of God. He didn't say the promise is just too hard to believe. No. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. That's how we please God. We simply believe what he says and never go back from it. Because look what it says. Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. He was persuaded. He had evidence, not blind faith of the churches, no, but evidence in the Bible that God could do the impossible. Almighty God had waited until now to announce that time of the child's birth. And it was going to be a miracle because God can do anything. He can work with people who are past giving of a child. He even gave them the name. You'll call him Isaac. It means laughter. And they would certainly laugh when this event happened. So in short time after that, Isaac is born. We can look at the record. We haven't got time to do it now that he grew and he developed his own faith strong faith like his father in those promises. Isaac then in turn had a son called Jacob and he believed the same promises. His life is laid out for us, but he had 12 sons. And so we see the, the beginnings of the nation of Israel. But most importantly for Abraham and for us, God's kept his promise. They had a child just as God said. God said, I'll give you a child that will grow into a nation. And he kept that part of the problem. A small piece of the prophecy, a piece of the jigsaw puzzle is in place. You see, Abraham knows he's fully persuaded because he's got the evidence living in his house. A vital part of God's overall prophecy has been fulfilled. God hadn't forgotten them. It was 25 years down the track, but God had acted exactly as he said. So after Abram died, God kept his promise. Israel, 70 odd people of the family went into Egypt and then God brought them out of Egypt. In Exodus 19, God says to them, you have seen they're on their way out of Egypt when this is written. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. What was that? Well, Egypt just happened to be the mightiest superpower of the day. And God destroyed it. Why? Because the Pharaoh said, you are not going to take away my slaves. God gave him 10 opportunities to change his mind, which he never did. And God destroyed that nation to bring out his people because he had a promise to keep. And he says, I brought you unto myself. Then he says something in very important. Now, therefore, God says to the nation that's out, coming out of Egypt, he says, if you will obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. You'll be my people. Look what he says then. For all the earth is mine. God does control the whole world. He says he does. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Great blessings would continue for his people if they would be faithful like their fathers. That's the challenge they had. It's the challenge we have. Will we obey God? Will we believe and obey? God would make the nation a kingdom, he says. That simply, by extension, means he's also going to give them a king. The prophecies. Now Israel is going to be a kingdom. It's also going to have a king and it's now a nation, just as God said. Two million people approximately came out of Egypt and God is now taking them to the land he promised to Abraham. There are now going to be a nation separated 
to living a godly way of life. That's what God wanted for them. And God had given assurance to Abraham and 400 years later, his child of promise had been born and grown into the nation of Israel just as God prophesied. You see, he not only says what he will do, he does exactly what he says. We have to believe and wait for God to act. There's one other prophecy. We're going to leave Abram now. There's one other prophecy we need to look at because we've discovered that God was going to give them a king. So we need to come another thousand years. Now we're at a thousand years before Christ was born. This is a promise to the second king of the nation of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read this. Again, the angel comes, talks to Abram, and this is what he says. When your days are fulfilled and when you sleep with your fathers, when you die, David, God says, I am going to set up thy seed. Here's this seed again, which shall proceed out of your bowels and I'm going to establish his kingdom. See, this just builds on what we already know. He'll build a house for my name. There's two houses here. One is a household of people. And the other is a temple, a house where people will come to worship God when the prophecies are fulfilled. He said, and I will establish this seed's throne. Again, look forever. See how these link completely with the Abrahamic promise? Exactly. <coughs> and then he says, I'll be his father and he will be my son. It's not hard to guess who this seed is, is it? A little more on that in a minute. In, in summary, he says, Thy house, thy kingdom will be established forever before thee, David. Thy throne shall be established forever. The prophecy is simple. I'm going to establish a kingdom and I'm going to give it to one of your seeds, David. I will be his father and it's going to be established forever before thee. Notice the yellow writing. So God's son is going to rule over Israel from David's throne in Jerusalem forever, because that's where he reigned from. David is also being told that he, like the people of Abraham, Abraham's promise, are going to live forever in that kingdom. You see, it's going to be before David. But the start of the prophecy said, you're going to die. So he too will be resurrected. All believers that die will be resurrected because God has the power. So let's give us some real proof to make sure we've got the right seed. Who is this king promised to David? Again, in Luke chapter 1, an angel comes to a woman called Mary and he says, you're going to have a son and his name is going to be Jesus. He's going to be great and he shall be called the son of the highest, God's son, just like David was told. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. It's so easy to follow, isn't it? He'll reign over the house of Jacob or Israel forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Everlasting kingdom, living forever. The prophecy yet again, see pieces of it all the way through. Jesus Christ is named God's son. God's son is Jesus Christ. But he's also in Matthew 1 verse 1, the very first phrase, the very first verse in the New Testament links the Old Testament and the New Testament because it says a generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abram. It's God's son. He said it's also it's Jesus who will rule as king over Israel forever and his kingdom there shall be no end. Well, what we're doing is simply adding up what God tells us. Very simply, very straightforward. But Christ is actually going to reign over more than Israel because God develops the prophecy into an incredible prophecy. Back in the Old Testament, we're already told that the God of heaven was going to set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. That's what we've heard. And it will stand forever. Notice in that middle there it says, you won't be left to other people. You have to be a believer to be part of this promise, these prophecies. And notice also it says, 
that it shall break. This kingdom that God is going to set up is going to break in pieces and consume all other kingdoms. There'll only be one kingdom of God. Later on, the prophet Daniel is told that it is God's son that is going to rule the world, not just Israel, as we see, but now it's going to be the world. In Daniel chapter 7, I saw in a night vision and behold, one like the son of man. That's a title of Jesus Christ, well before he's born, at least 500 years before. And there was given unto him, in prospect this is, this is a vision of what's to come, a kingdom that all people, all nations and languages will serve him. And it'll be an everlasting reign. It'll never pass away. The king will never die. And the kingdom will never be destroyed. It can't be because it's going to last forever. And the people in it are going to live forever. A little few verses later, the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That's the believers, the multitude of people who will listen to these promises and come to understand that they can live forever in a kingdom with an everlasting king. So Christ is going to reign over all people, all nations, a worldwide kingdom, and we can reign with him if we believe because that's the name saints has given to those believers. So Jesus Christ, with his believers, the saints, will rule the world forever in the kingdom of God. Let's summarise again the prophecy for the nation of Israel. Israel, whole history, was built on a multifaceted prophecy from Almighty God. We've seen the bits and pieces and we've joined them together. God promised Abram a nation when he had no son, but he believed God could do it and he did. God promised to care for that nation. Israel still exists today even though we're going to see it probably shouldn't. God promised his own son, Jesus Christ, thousands of years before he was born, and he came. He promised his son, Jesus, to Abraham and to David and to a multitude of believers throughout the ages that they would inherit a world at peace. God promised that he would set up Jesus Christ as king of the earth and he will reign in Jerusalem over the entire world which he will bring to peace that will last forever. God promised all faithful believers, if you die, you don't have to worry because all these other things I've done, I can resurrect you. I created you. I can also bring you back from the dead to be with Christ when all this comes to pass. Christ will rule the entire world, helped by faithful believers from every age. And they will bring our world to a real peace in the kingdom of God, which shall never end. We're simply just adding up, joining the dots, if you like. Here's the rub. You might be sitting there thinking, can I really believe all this stuff? This is almost fantasy, isn't it? It would be, but it's God who's giving the promise. That's the wonderful thing. And that's what Abram understood. Remember Abram. He believed or he had faith, the same thing, that God could do the impossible. And that's the challenge Almighty sets before anyone from any age who would seek out him and what he's doing. In Hebrews 11, again, the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's not a blind faith. No, it's got substance. You can actually understand it and believe it. It's the evidence of things not seen. We can't see the kingdom of God yet, but we get the evidence that it's going to happen from the Bible. And notice what he says, and by it, the elders obtained a good report. They believed God, though they didn't see it. The substance, the evidence only comes from reading one book, the Bible. And it gives us hope in a world ladies and gentlemen, that frankly has no hope. Think about the world we live in now. God is offering you a sure hope that will last forever. 
The things that we can't see will happen because we have God guaranteeing it. Verse 6 of that same chapter, he says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, that he actually exists. You can't do it any other way because God won't accept it. You can do whatever you like. You can do all the good works in the world. You've got to have the faith that believes God's promises or prophecies and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek. It's going to take some time, some effort. Verse 13 and 14, referring to Abraham, particularly, and others in this chapter, says these all died in faith, not having received the promises. They didn't get the kingdom. They aren't living forever. They're asleep in the ground. But having seen them afar off, they knew it was coming. And they believed God what he said, but they were absolutely persuaded as if they had exactly everything they needed to know. We've seen the outline of that tonight. There's much more evidence that so we can be persuaded as well. And they embraced them. They absolutely took hold of them. And then they went around telling everybody. They confessed to everybody they saw that they were strangers on the earth. They'd been promised the world. But they went around telling everybody they plainly seek a country. They are all looking for the kingdom of God. They just knew it wasn't going to happen then. We appeal to you, make every effort to listen to and to believe the substance, the evidence that the Bible brings forth so that you may have hope of a better world that is coming. So what happened to Israel? They've been given incredible, mind-boggling promises. What happened? What happened? Because... We started the lecture saying they were regathered after 2,000 years of not being there. They were in the land. What went wrong? God's promises are what that nation was built on. While God would ensure that those promises come to pass, remember he required that people believe and obey him by living godly lives before him in thankfulness for what God has promised and what he's going to do. So why were the Jews cast out of the promised land that they were in? They had the seeds of the promise with them. In AD 70, profane history records the Jews were literally cast out of the land of Israel by the Romans. But they'd been regathered in 1948. Why did that happen? Well, you see, another thousand years after King David, we come to the time of Jesus Christ when he was born as prophesied all over the Old Testament and sadly the religious the Jewish religious leaders in Israel had gone away from God they were corrupt the God they worshipped was their own power and their own position within society in Israel they'd lost their way because they hadn't taken seriously and remembered what God had told them they had actually forgotten the power of the promises of the coming kingdom. So they couldn't teach it to the people, which was their God-given duty as priests. Priests are teachers. They'd forgotten the promises. Hard to think that that could happen. But it did. That led to the people that were under them, supposedly looked after by them, to becoming unsure and confused about those same beliefs. You see, they didn't all run around with Bibles like we do. It was, it was given by memory. A lot of it was passed down family by family. There were some Bibles, but not like we've got today. And so the people became unsure about what they actually, they, they remembered bits and pieces of it. They did expect the king. He was promised. They remembered that much. A king to come and save them. They thought, he was going to come and save them from the Roman people. It was never the issue. But they were unsure. And so most didn't recognise a man who came as a lowly servant. His name was Jesus. He was their Messiah. And as he went around Israel preaching everywhere how to enter into the coming kingdom of God. He knew what he was about. 
He had not forgotten, but they were unsure. And when you've got wicked rulers, you're in great difficulty. You see, eventually after three and a half years of his preaching the coming kingdom, provoked by wicked Jewish rulers, finally the people with those rulers, combined with the Roman rulers, they put a troublemaker who said that he was equal with God. That's what they said, he said. He never did. He said he was God's son. They lied about it and they had him crucified. They killed the one that was in the promises, the promise. They killed the one that's going to deliver them. Here's two quotes just to show you how bad things had gotten. In Matthew 13, because they seeing can't see, they see not. You see, Jesus started speaking in parables. He made it hard for them. He wanted them to think. If they were going to be part of the promise, they had to start thinking and they were dull. They had ears, but they heard nothing. It didn't make sense to them. So they lost their understanding. And he says, this people's heart is wax gross. That's Israel. Abraham's people had lost their way. But then he turns to the disciples, he said, but blessed are your eyes and your ears because you see and hear. You see, there were some in Israel that were alive to the Messiah coming. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders. Look, he says, you've shut up the kingdom of heaven. You've shut up God's kingdom. You haven't. You're not thinking about it yourself. You won't go in yourselves. Neither will you suffer those people, the Jews, to enter in. They locked it all away. You see, they actually thought, we are Abraham's children by birthright. That's how we'll get in the kingdom. They changed everything to suit themselves. Sadly, it just doesn't make any, has no effort, has no effect, because you've got to do things the way God says. What would God do with this people now that they've crucified his son? Surely that would be the end. Surely that would be too much. The Bible will tell us. Would the evil of man outweigh the promises and the goodness of God? Absolutely not. We're not dealing with man here. We are dealing with almighty God. God didn't cast them away entirely because he promised Abraham, I will look after that nation. No one will ever destroy it. So God won't destroy it either. But he rightly and justly punished them, look at these words, to roam the earth without the hope of Israel, without the hope that was given to their fathers. They ca God cast them out. He punished them for 2,000 years. That punishment was going to last until Jesus Christ would return from heaven. Then things would be set straight. Those left of Israel will finally recognise Jesus when he comes as their saviour and king. It's all in the Bible. Quotes there, you can look at them. And they will actually, when they see him, they'll see the holes in his hands and they'll mourn for what their fathers did and they'll take responsibility for it. And they'll go away and they'll cry and pray unto God. And they will real repent, the Bible tells us. And they will then call out for God and he will hear them. This is extraordinary stuff then God will forgive them. And he will say unto them, and this is actually in that verse of Zechariah 13, God will say, it is my people, I recognise them again, because now they believe me, and they believe my son. And they will say, the Lord is my God. And finally, things will be set straight, and Israel will become God's people again. The Apostle Paul gives us further evidence. He spoke of this very issue. In Romans 11, he says, hath God cast away his people? It was the obvious question once they realised they had killed their Messiah. Or well, what will God do? Will he cast the people away? No, God forbid. Certainly not. God hath not cast away his people. Look at this. Which he foreknew. He knew what Israel were going to do. And he had plans in place all the way along so that he would never destroy that nation, nor let anyone else, but he will bring them back and they will acknowledge him as right. In that same chapter, the Apostle Paul writes a whole chapter about this. He says, 
For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery or secret. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Because they wouldn't listen to the promises, God blinded them so they couldn't see. Look until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Israel had the promises for 2,000 years. They threw it away for lack of attention, lack of care, lack of reading their Bible. And God said, okay, I'm going to give it to the Gentiles. Guess what? For 2,000 years, we have had opportunity, all the people in the world that are not Jews, to listen to the same promises. And he says, and so all Israel shall be saved. When it's over, as it is written, all that we are talking about, it's all in the Bible. Prophesy, prophecy after prophecy of what would happen to Israel until there will come out of Zion the Deliverer. That's Jesus Christ when he returns. And he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. They will return in faith to God through Christ. For this is my covenant unto them. Then I shall take away their sins. He'll forgive them. As concerning the gospel, he goes on, they are enemies at the moment for your sakes, Gentiles. But as touching the election, they're God's nation. They are beloved for Abram, Isaac and Jacob's sakes. God will never cast off Israel, but he will be right and true to them. And then finally he says, for the gifts, the calling of God are without repentance. Man can never stop God from doing what he wants to do. Because he is the God that's created the universe. Go have a look outside. That's what he's created. If he can do that, he can do anything. So, Israel regathered. Prophecy fulfilled. Jesus knew the awful punishments that would come upon the Jews in about 40 years' time, he spoke this prophecy and it would happen very soon after, in about 40 years after he speaks it. It's a prophecy of AD 70 and it's also a prophecy of our time. This prophecy is going to go from then right through to 1948 and the Israel were regathered, just as this prophecy requires. He warned a few of his disciples at the time of the punishments to come in AD 70. He's in AD 30. And how God would regather them prior to the return, prior to his own return and the setting up of the kingdom of God, which all these promises are about. He had also revealed in this prophecy signs to look for that would encourage believers that the time was near. One of those signs is the regathering of the nation itself out of the world after not existing for 2,000 years. And the other is he said, I'll show you some signs that's going on in the world that will show you that I'm coming. Luke 21 is a prophecy given by Jesus to his disciples two days before they crucified him about Israel's immediate future right through to the return to setting up the kingdom of God, which would fulfill those promises to Abram and David. So these are his own words. Luke 21, we read this tonight. We begin at verse 20 to 24, where he tells the people what's coming upon them in the next 40 years. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, that was the Roman armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Jerusalem is about to be conquered. That happened in AD 66 through to 70. It's history. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mass. Get out of Israel. Get out of Jerusalem. Don't come back into the land. He knew what was coming. For these are the days of vengeance. When God gets angry, God really, it's a fearful thing. All these things that are written will be fulfilled. See, they're all in the Bible. The death of Jesus, because of the death of Jesus Christ, God would punish the Jews as he prophesied, which we've looked at. But woe unto them, he says, that are with child, that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath among the people. He really did understand what was going to happen. He had looked at that city and burst into tears at one stage because he knew what was coming. He said, they'll fall by the edge of the sword, the Roman sword, and they'll be led away as slaves into all nations. And that's where we saw them until 1948. 
Many Jews were going to be slain. The rest would be scattered amongst all the nations and Israel would be abolished for a time. Jerusalem, then he says, look, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until, there's a time limit here, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Israel had their opportunity with the promises. The Gentiles, we have had that same opportunity, but there's going to come a time when Jerusalem is going to be back in the hands of the Jews. Think about that. There would come a time after Jesus spoke this prophecy in AD 30 when the capital of Israel would come back into Jewish control. They became a nation again in 48. They got Jerusalem in 1967. Jesus Christ is talking about times in which I lived. I was born the year after that nation was proclaimed. I saw 1967, not unfortunately having any idea about those promises in those days. Anyway, Jesus' prophecy moves on then to our generation. He's got to 1967 and he gives us the signs that we can look for in the world that start from 1967 and that will lead to his coming back to the earth. He goes on in the same chapter, just the next verse. He said, look for this. You'll be seeing signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. This is Bible language. Jesus says, look at the government powers. That's the sun in the Bible. Religious powers. That's the moon in the Bible. And the stars, individual statements. He said, the signs you're going to see are in the authorities, the governments and the religious powers of the world. Look there. That's where you'll see the problems. What will these signs be? Well, they're likened to birth pangs, very heavy birth pangs. They come and then they go. They come and then they go. And they come and they go, but eventually the baby is born. Eventually the kingdom of God will come after much trouble in the world. He says there'll be just stress of nations. That word means a narrowing of the way. From 1967... The narrowing of the way would come. What does that mean? The world governments will find it increasingly difficult to solve the problems of the day. Of the day. From 1960, so think about Brexit. How long did it take Britain to get out of the EU? It's been in the Bible for two and a half thousand years, but it took years to get out once they decided to. Climate change. Is anyone really serious? See, the problems are just too hard. It's just too hard. And then he adds with perplexity. That word simply means no way out. There'll be no leaders capable of solving the problems and the people won't listen to them either. Look at the world you live in, ladies and gentlemen. 9-11 in 2002. There's a birth pack. The world changed from that point on, didn't it? The GFC in 2007-2009 2009, just about flattened the world's economy. It took... Australia till last year to proclaim we finally balanced the budget 10 years. And they didn't quite make it because COVID-19 happened. And now we're getting out of that, it would seem, and look at the economy. They'll never get out of that. Birth pains coming that they can't solve. Problems that the leaders can't solve. The sea and the wave roaring, Christ said. Unrest among the troubled nations, angry with each other. Look at America and China, the two superpowers. Look at them. They just distrust each other. They cannot get on together. More signs. Finally, he says, men's hearts will be failing them. These aren't the leaders. These are people like us who are living in the world, who are going to fear for the things that we can see coming upon the earth if we start thinking seriously. COVID-19, a massive economic fallout that's happening right now and more and more and more events until Christ comes. We know because the Bible says the final birth pain will be this one. The Russian armies together with European armies are going to move into the Middle East particularly in Israel, to do what? To destroy the Jews in a bid to take over the world. And there's mountains of information on that. But remember, God promised Abram that he would care for Israel. 
They can't destroy Israel. That's what's going to bring Christ back to the earth. He's going to come to save the Jews because God won't let it happen. The next verse, verse 27, he says, Then you will see the Son of Man. When that happens, you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. He's coming to set up the kingdom and it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to, God, it, God through Christ is going to destroy the nations that have ruled their people so terribly. There's not one nation in the world that cares for the poor people. Never has been, never will be until Christ sets up his king. So Jesus Christ will return in power to judge the nations, beginning with the battle of Armageddon when the Russian armies will be destroyed and Israel will be saved from extinction. When these things begin to come to pass, he says in the next verse, he says, you look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draws not. He says, well, let's go back a step. Let's go back a step because before we get to that point, I am coming to rescue the believers. Those that are dead will be raised. Those that are alive will be taken to him before Russia gets in to them, into Israel. Notice it is. It's be the beginning of these things when the reward will come. So now he moves the signs, not to the world, but he says, now let's look at Israel because they're part of this. So he now focuses on Israel as another sign for us to see. Verse 29 and 30, the same chapter. He spoke a parable we have to think about. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. A parable is a story with a hidden meaning about the kingdom of God. The fig tree, the Bible tells us, is a symbol of the nation of Israel. All the trees, well, they must be nations like Israel. When they shoot forth, he says, know that summer's coming. Jesus plainly says, look to see the nation of Israel reborn in the world. It's happened. God prophesied it. Jesus Christ is actually going to make it happen. 1948. And many other new nations like them. At the same time, you see, the United Nations grew from 51 nations in 1945 when they proclaimed the nation of Israel. By the end of the century, there was 189 nations amongst the UN. Fig tree and all the other trees. It's very simple. Very simple. Summer is nigh at hand, he said. That's harvest time in any, any country of the world. But this one is the harvest of the nations that is coming. Prophecy fulfilled, ladies and gentlemen. The nation of Israel, is it there? I don't even have to answer that, do I? It's happened. Just as our lecture title proclaimed. Just as because it's in the Bible. He goes on, two more verses. He says, now, consider this. When you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Simple. When you see the rebirth of Israel as a nation, happened in 1948. When you see Jerusalem back in the hands of the Jews, 1967, that's where the prophecy started for us. And when you see all the other signs that are in the world, which we've looked at, it's all fulfilled, it's done. No, these are his words, know that the kingdom of God is nigh. These signs will bring the kingdom promised to Abraham and to David. And he says, truly, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. A generation in the Bible is 70, perhaps 80 years by definition. So the generation of people alive in 1948 will see the kingdom of God set up. will see Christ in the earth. You see, God's promises of Christ's return as king of the world ruling with Abraham and David and all the other believers in a world of peace forever, when this happens, will be a reality in the world. Heaven and earth, he says, can pass away, but my words will come true. Heaven and earth can't pass away. What he's saying is, of course, what I said is going to happen. The impossible will happen, ladies and gentlemen, because God prophesied, he planned it out, 
gave it to his prophets right through the ages, and he's making it happen point by point by point. None of Christ's words will ever pass away. They will be fulfilled. Jesus Christ said Abram's faith will be rewarded. He lived 2,000 years after Abram. Abram had never been forgotten. Here's Christ's words. I say unto you, many shall come from the east and the west, and they will sit down with Abraham and his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. God has never forgotten Abram. It's 4,000 years since he spoke, began speaking to Abram, nor any other believers. They sleep, awaiting the resurrection to eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, we appeal to you the simplicity and yet the amazing power of God recorded in this book is there for all of us to take hold of. But we must search it out and believe it. Thank you.